Hey, folks. Uh, oh, I see Shadow Wind is here already, and she's bringing the monkeys. Thank you. Thank you. We need monkeys for this stream. <laughs> we have 17 in the story, but you know what? I think the only thing that can make the story better is more monkeys. Am I right? Are we in agreement, folks? Uh, so, hi, everyone. Um, if you are just tuning in for the first time, I am Lindsay G. I am a writer and uh, the editor in chief and co founder of Oneshi Press, a small indie publishing company based out of Missoula, Montana. I am working on a series of novellas. Well, I shouldn't call it a series, sorry. I have to watch my words. I'm working on a collection of novellas called Tales from Existentia. And this collection started up last year with the publication of Dwayne, which was a story about a woman who wakes up one day and finds that there is a 15 ton boulder sitting in her living room, which has appeared mysteriously and which completely changes her life, upends everything. Um, that came out last year, as I said, and now I am in the throes of working on the second tale from Existentia, which is called Monkey Maids. So, oh, hello, Yuki. Thank you so much for being here. Um, everyone who is watching, if you are logged into YouTube, you can say hello in the, um, the text chat. I would love to know that you're here because... One of the reasons that I'm reading this story live is I am looking for feedback from, you know, I'm going to call you readers since I am reading to you. Um, I am in the final stages of editing this book and I'm going to be publishing it in a few months time. And I really would like to get feedback from folks who are watching. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, the... The first two parts of the story have been read in other live streams. So if you're coming in late, you can catch those on the Oneshi Press YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash Oneshi Press, just like it sounds, that uh, I think you have to go to the live tab, actually, to find them because they were recorded live. Um, parts one and part two are available there, and you can catch up on everything that's going on with the 17 Monkeys and two roommates who are splitting a two-bedroom apartment in Chicago and trying to get along with each other. <laughs> Yuki says, Flanders and Daijubu and Piggy Corn are watching too. Oh, awesome. Oh, I have a whole audience. If they have any feedback on things, please do let me know, Yuki. Um, so let's see. What's been going on in the story so far? So in, in part one, we met Leo. Uh, he's sort of the, the narrator and main character of the story. He is alone in his apartment for a while. And while his roommate is gone, he impulsively buys 17 monkeys from an ad that he finds in the back of a comic book. So now he's living with 17 monkeys. They've been there for about a week. And he feels like they are socialized enough and he has a good enough um, rapport with them that he can start renting them out for events. So that's what he is doing. Um, he does it for one night before his companion slash ex-girlfriend, maybe, slash friend slash roommate Liz shows back up. And she is, understandably, astonished to find that the apartment is full of monkeys. <laughs> oh, hello, Oneshi Press. I believe that this is JL Draco tuning in. Um, says, I am on my way home to got you Bluetooth to the car speakers. Ooh. <laughs> and was it a catfish comic? No. As Yuki has astutely pointed out, it was a Mr. Guy comic. Uh, Mr. Guy Zombie Hunter comic that he found in the drawer of a piece of furniture that he picked up on the street and dragged back to his apartment. So the situation with Liz and Leo appears to be that they're struggling financially. Uh, they really don't have much at home and he thinks that by renting out the monkeys for evening events he can make a bunch of money plus get to live with a bunch of monkeys you know win-win as far as he's concerned so he makes up a whole story about how the monkeys came to be there how he rescued them from a research lab uh hoping that he will get liz on his side and that everyone will live happily together with all of these monkeys and as of the last uh, part that I read, part two, basically we were seeing that Liz had some reservations about this idea, but she was kind of willing to give it a chance. She said, 
I'll tell you what, let's give it a few days. I don't have to go back to work till Wednesday. So let's see what happens between now and Wednesday with the monkeys. And that's pretty much where we left off. Um, I wonder if Mr. Guy would buy 16 monkeys, says Yuki. <laughs> Good question. Good question. Hmm. No, I don't think Mr. Guy would buy that many. I feel like Mr. Guy might buy like two monkeys. Like, I think he would definitely buy monkeys, but I don't think he would go quite as far as Leo has. <laughs> so for those who are watching, um, I have a question. Do any of you have a favorite monkey so far? I tried, I didn't want to go into depth about each monkey's personality and what they look like because we would be there forever describing 17 different monkeys. But there have been a few that we've seen more of, like um, Sandy, uh, the female spider monkey. Um, she went to, I think it was an LGBT like fundraising event with Daisy. Then there's Lambert, the golden, ta golden lion tamarin, who is kind of becoming BFS with Leo. Um, there's, I think, Philo, the squirrel monkey, who Leo keeps saying scares him, but he doesn't really specify why. Uh, Shadowin says, JL will have to do a Mr. Guy monkey wrangler advert. Ooh, <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh and Shadowwind also says, I like the lion tamarind. Me too. He's he's a real chill guy. Um, <clears throat> we are actually going to see a lot more of... Oh, I'm going to forget his name. Ah, In this installment, we're going to see a lot more of the capuchin monkey, but I can't off the top of my head remember what his name is. Um, Yuki says, they all sound so cute. I love them all. <laughs> awesome. <sighs> okay, so... On this reading, folks, I'm taking a big risk. Uh, I It was sometime last week, I think, I was just kind of chilling and suddenly realized that I needed to rework the end of the story. I've already reworked the end of the story several times, and I thought that I had settled on how I wanted it to end, but it still felt like there was just something not quite right about it, about the timeline. So today actually and over the weekend i spent a bunch of time moving things around and um rewriting a whole bunch so i have not had time to edit most of this and i am nervous about reading it but you are my beta readers <laughs> you are my people so uh just bear with me as i'm reading like if i I may find little errors that I have to fix as I go through, or I may realize that I completely forgot about something, or there's cut and paste errors, so this might be a, a bit challenging, but I'm going to be sharing basically the first draft of several pages of writing with you. So this is uncharted territory. I am definitely one of those writers who likes to do the majority of the work all by myself before I share it with anybody. <laughs> so... <sighs> Um, Shadowin says, can I ask an off-topic question before you start? If not, I can ask later. Hmm, yeah, sure, go ahead. We can uh, we can take a little bit of time for people to filter in before we start reading. I'm going to have some tea. Mm -hmm. Yuki says, I'm hyped for the ending. I think it will be great. Huh, Yuki, for your sake, I'm glad that I changed the original ending. <laughs> I don't think you would have liked that one very much. Uh, Shadowin says, if you were a dragon, what color dragon would you be? Me? Personally? That's a really good question. I think, um, I think I'd be a gold dragon. Shiny gold. I think. That, that, it would be interesting to get other people's opinions on that. Um, but yeah, I think I'd be a golden dragon. Maybe sort of like a coppery even. That would be cool. Uh, Yuki says, I love the monkey story a lot. Yay! <laughs> I'd love to know what everyone else thinks, um, not just about what color I would be as a dragon, but what color you would be. Like, Yuki, what color dragon would you be? And Shadowwind, what color dragon would you be? Um, da -ba -ba -ba. Yuki says, I would want to be an orange dragon. 
Shadow Wind says, ooh, gold is a good color. I like copper too. Yeah, I wonder if there's like um an in-betweeny, you know, maybe like an iridescent kind of thing where like in sunlight it looks more yellowy and gold and in sunlight it looks more orangey and coppery. That would be cool. Hmm. That was a very good question. I have never really pondered that before. Um, Jail says, I would be an iridescent black dragon. Mm, suit yourself. I think you're a blue dragon still. Whatever. Hmm. I think I might be a black and teal and iridescent dragon, says Shadowwind. Cool, cool, cool. Yuki says, orange and pink are my favorite colors. And Jail says, Sky says she would be black iridescent too. <laughs> I wonder if she thought that before you said it, or you said it, and she was like, ooh, that sounds nice. I'm intrigued. I've always thought that JL would be a dark blue shiny dragon, but he says that that's part of the black iridescent dragon thing. Um, Yuki says, also, if Landers could fit in your cup, that girl. <laughs> yeah, this is a giant, giant cup. Well, these readings get long, you know? Gotta be hydrated. And caffeinated. I have some gunpowder green tea with honey today. Um, Jail says, she said it before I said anything. Hmm, interesting. So you're matching dragons? Cool. Mm -hmm. I always think of Jail as a green dragon, says Yuki. Yeah, I could see that too. I think he's going to say that's the other iridescent. So it's like black, blue, green, depending on the light and how you're looking at it. Probably. Hmm. If I was going to be a monkey, I'd probably be a, a night monkey. <laughs> I was just looking at my monkey list today while I was writing, and I was just thinking, night monkeys are cool. <laughs> if anyone has Google available, I encourage you to look up night monkeys. They're so cute. <laughs> Let me see. The um, I still have my monkey list up. I just have to find the night monkeys. Don't mess with me. Nope. 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 The document is pretending like I don't have night monkeys, so I can't find them. Never mind. There we go. Night monkeys, also known as owl monkeys or Duroculus. There are two of them in this story. One is named Adrian and one is named Lydia. They are both female. Night monkeys have large brown eyes. The size of the eyes improves their nocturnal vision, increasing their ability to be active at night. Males and females are similar in weight. The heaviest species of night monkey is Azara's night monkey at around 2.765 pounds. And the lightest is Brumbach's night monkey, which weighs between 1.003 and 1.929 pounds. Anyway, they're very cute. They look kind of like lemurs. Um, they've got the, like, really big eyes. Anyhow, Jail says, I'm telling you, it's all the iridescence. <laughs> Jail says he'd be one of them tiny thumb monkeys. Those are pygmy marmosets, and they are tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny. Let me find the info that I have on that. Pygmy. Pygmy marmosets. We have one in the story. Her name is Marge, as in Large Marge from uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Um, the pygmy marmoset is one of the world's smallest primates, being the smallest true monkey with a head body length ranging from 4.6 to 6 inches and a tail of 6.8 to 9 inches. The average adult body weight is just over 3.5 ounces. <laughs> and that's a full grown one, too. So, you know, a little baby monkey could actually, like, wrap around your thumb. That's why in some places I have seen them called thumb monkeys. Um, Shadowwind says, oh, they have really big eyes. Yeah, the night monkeys, right? And Yuki says, I would love to be a ringtail lemur. Yeah. Yeah, I decided against putting lemurs in this story. I wanted to keep it to monkeys. No apes, no lemurs, just monkeys. <laughs> the, although what he got was called the primate party pack. So I guess that means that 
perhaps they also did have other types of primates available. Either that or somebody just really likes alliteration. Okay, folks, <clears throat> are you ready for the end of Monkey Maids? I think it is time for me to start reading. Um, I'm going to first open the blinds on the window because earlier the sun was shining like directly onto my face and it was not working lighting wise, but I think that's done now. So I want some light in this room. All right, let's see if the camera adjusts. There we go. Okay. All right, folks. So if you remember where we left off, it's got to reload. Da, 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 da. Okay, so where we left off last time, uh, they had gotten most of the monkeys with paid gigs off to their respective places for the evening. And they were like settling in. I believe that they went grocery shopping. There was a whole incident where Leo got carried away with a shopping cart. And um, then on their way home, Liz was saying, you know, I'm not really sure if this is going to be a good idea. And he kind of talked her down. So things are a little tense, uh, but going okay. And that's sort of where we left off last time. So now we're starting with chapter 10. Now this is a long chapter. I might have to take a break in the middle, but I want you all to know, you who are watching, that I'm mostly not going to be reading chat because I have a different screen open to be reading the story from. So if I don't respond uh, right away, just wait till I get to a stopping point. <laughs> okay, here we go. Chapter 10. It was nearly nine when my phone rang. We weren't expecting any of the rented monkeys home until 11 at the earliest, so the unknown number made me nervous. What if something had happened to Lambert? Hello, Leo, came a vaguely familiar older male voice. I wanted to check in on your experience with the monkeys you purchased about a week ago. It was the dude from the comic book ad, the monkey guy, calling me on a Sunday evening. Oh, yeah, hi. I replied slowly, trying to look casual as Liz glanced up from her cuddle session with Philo the Squirrel Monkey, a question on her face. I smiled widely at her and held up, the, held up a finger as I made for the kitchen. Yeah, things are going great, I continued slowly. Thanks for checking in. It's rare that we get such a large order from a residential address, he said, so I thought I would call to see if you need any support from us. Everyone kept going on about my residential address. First Daisy, now this guy, even Liz. Did they think I needed a whole zoo just to chill with some monkeys? Look, dude, this isn't a great time, I said, peering back into the living room. Liz was stroking Philo's belly lazily with one hand, a glass of wine in the other. Was she listening to me? We're just getting everyone settled for the night, you know, and interruptions can really... Oh, say no more, he rejoined. I know how that goes. Trust me. There was a beat of silence. Then I blurted. Things really are going well with the whole troop. We're figuring out their favorite foods, getting into a grooming routine, still working on potty training. He laughed. That's a real bitch. I've been there. Keep at it, though. They'll learn. I've got a few resources that I could email to you if you like. Whoa, really? That would be great. When I got back to the living room, having promised a five-star review to the monkey guy, Liz looked up from a lap full of monkeys. Philo had been joined by Lucy the Vervet and Marge the Pygmy Marmoset for a very cute cuddle sesh. Truth be told, she'd been a much quicker success with the whole troop than I had. She did have a calming energy about her. And, I reminded myself, I had already gotten them well settled in before she arrived. Who was that? Liz asked nonchalantly. But she was doing that thing where she carefully avoided eye contact to pretend she wasn't as interested as she really was. I stiffened. Uh... Her eyebrows raised a fraction of an inch, but she kept looking down at the monkeys. It was Johannes, I said, pouring her some more wine. Checking on the monkeys. He's a good guy, you know. Wanted to know if I needed anything. She nodded, stroked Marge, and then looked up. Weird that he needed your email address, since you're already such good friends. Her voice tilted up at the end. I shrugged. Well, you know me, Liz. I'm not an online kind of guy. I don't usually email my friends when I could just call them. She nodded again, sipping her wine. But he says he found some potty training resources he's going to send, I soldiered on. We'll have these monkeys using the crapper in no time. 
She pursed her lips just a bit, but then there was a loud and uneven knock on the door. Liz, the monkeys, and I all jumped visibly. We weren't expecting anyone to return for another half hour yet. I set Francis down to Philo and made for the door. It was the professor, a diminutive man who looked like he wore tweed and elbow patches while teaching, history of literature or something. He had rented Tina the bonnet macaque for what he called a salon at another professor's house. I had imagined a salon of PhD holding liberal arts types would be a sedate wine and cheese affair, so I had no compunction sending Tina off with him. At around nine pounds, and with quite an attitude, I knew she could hold her own anyway. What I hadn't expected was for the professor to be tanked by 9.30 p.m. He was leaning heavily in the doorway, Tina perched uncertainly on his shoulder, tail up and light on her feet as, she, as he stood up straighter, swaying precariously. Professor? I said. He opened his eyes and wide in a mockery of sobriety and offered a lopsided smile. Hello there, he slurred. Stepping toward him, I got a heady draft of sour red wine on his breath. I held my arm out toward Tina, who gratefully clambered into my grasp. I gave her a quick once-over, but saw no obvious injuries. As I sniffed her breath for, an even, for even the faintest whiff of booze, she grabbed my ears with her small hands and babbled something in my face. She was sober, but insistent. I cradled her to my chest and glowered at the professor. We had a lovely time at the salon, he sloshed with a little hiccup. She was a big hit. Great, bro, I said. Have a good night. I turned back to the house, disgusted. This dude was going on the no list, a suggestion Liz had offered earlier. Dude could hardly stand up, much less care for our, our precious primates. Liz was standing close to the inner door, probably listening to the exchange when I opened it. I kicked the outer door behind me, but I didn't hear it close. Instead, a stumbling noise, followed by the doorknob banging into the wall. Tina leaped from my arms into Liz's, startled by the noise. I whirled to find the professor behind me, wild-eyed as he stared into the living room at the troop, most of whom were watching the act in the mudroom with casual interest. What the f- I began. What's going on in there? He asked, craning his neck to get a better look at the monkeys dotting the floor and furniture behind Liz, who was glaring at him while patting Tina. Bro, I said, starting toward him. Is this really a monkey house? He asked bringing a hand up to his face to scratch his dark beard. Just kind of looks like an apartment. I felt my mouth tighten. Let's get you home, huh? I hissed. He pursed his lips in response, thinking hard against the alcohol. Should you even have all those monkeys in there? Is, is it, like, legal? He lurched toward me, trying to get in, but fell helplessly into my arms when he stumbled. I'm calling animal control, he slurred. This doesn't look good. I spun him around and pointed him toward the door, just as he began to retch. Oh, hell no. I got his head mostly outside the outer door before he started puking in earnest. By the look of it, I had been right. Definitely a wine and cheese affair. A lot of wine. Fucking foul. As his heaves died down, I began to close the outer door behind him, gently pushing his butt out onto the stoop. But I was surprised when Liz stormed past me, Tina having disembarked, and the inner door slammed shut behind her. As the professor straightened up from the mess he'd made, Liz faced him down, hands on hips and green fire in her eyes. I held my breath, partly because of the reek of vomit, but partly because I wanted to witness what was about to go down. I knew that pose. Professor Lombardi, was it? Liz said. It wasn't really a question. The professor nodded, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. She nodded curtly. You've just made a complete mess of our front stoop and our evening with the monkeys. You, in fact, are a mess. She didn't say he should be ashamed of himself, but the message was clear. Did you drive here in this state? She continued. With Tina, our only bonnet macaque, in your car? The professor turned to look at me with somewhat clearer eyes. I just raised my eyebrows and crossed my arms. Liz didn't let up. You have endangered the life of one of our troop, a member of a species that's in danger of losing its natural habitat in southern India. How did she know so much about monkeys? Tina is precious to us and to the world, Liz continued. How dare you behave so irresponsibly with her? 
The professor attempted to straighten up, but he had to steady himself on the stoop railing. I, he began, but Liz was having none of it. And then, trashed beyond all semblance of dignity, you dare to threaten us with a call to animal control? In your current state, they would laugh you off the phone. She crossed her arms in front of her chest. But go ahead, call them if you want to face the embarrassment. I assure you, they all know about our setup, which is perfectly legal. If you think you'd be the first to mistakenly call the authorities on us, you'd be even drunker than I thought. After a short pause, he burbled, I took a cab. Well, thank God for that, Liz rejoined. I recommend you get the hell back in that cab, go home, take an aspirin, and don't bother to darken our doorstep again, she said, looking pointedly at the Merlot stain. You are no longer welcome to rent from party primates. With that, she whirled on her heel. I opened the inner door for her and followed her inside. I was elated. Liz had not just stood up for our venture, but lied right to the guy's face in the process, all in the interest of keeping our partnership going. As she made her way over to Tina to give her a proper inspection, a grin split my face. Liz, I said breathlessly, you are magnificent. She spun around, still crouching, but somehow all the more impressive for it. Her eyes were burning and bright green as she peered up at me. According to my recent monkey studies, that look was a prelude to violence. Leo, she said. I swallowed my grin. We cannot just send these animals out with God knows who to do God knows what every night. Tina could have been killed if that guy had gotten behind the wheel. As if on cue, Tina wrapped her arms around Liz's neck and Liz straightened to standing with the monkey clinging to her. Hell, she could have been killed if he tripped on the stairs outside and fell on her, she continued. Unacceptable. Tina warbled softly and Liz buried her face into her neck fur, cooing back. I scratched my head. How had Liz, who had only been here for about ten hours, already become the comforter of the troop? Well, I began, we were talking earlier about a better vetting process. Maybe... She shook her head once, firmly, her face still planted in the monkey fur. Francis the TT monkey had approached and now hugged Liz's leg, looking up adorably with his dark eyes. She looked down with a sad smile, then crouched to pick him up, too. It's not enough she said simply as Francis clambered up to perch on top of her head. I clamped down the urge to grin at the juxtaposition of a small, dark brown primate picking through her hair while she looked at me so seriously. Whew. Okay, that was chapter 10. That was a long one. So, yeah, we have um, drunken professor crashing the party. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, we've got some chat going on here. Um, da -da 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 -da. I have a big soft spot for lemurs because of Zaboomafu. It was a show all about animals. Oh, yeah, Yuki. Okay, I didn't watch Zaboomafu a whole lot. It was a little bit, like, after my time. But the same people that did Zaboomafu had a show before that called Kratz Creatures that I used to watch religiously. I loved that show. And I think about 75% of everything I know about animals comes from the Kratz brothers. I love them. Oh, oh gosh. Okay. Um, a zoo, a circus, anywhere big enough with lots of room and toys for them, says Yuki. Yeah, it'd definitely be better than a two-bedroom apartment. <laughs> um, cuddling monkeys sounds like the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Um, the guy waits till after he used their monkey to be like, is this a monkey house? <laughs> Good point. Good point. I guess he was in too much of a hurry to think about it before or something. Um, Yuki says, wow, Liz is good. Liz is the true monkey queen. <laughs> yeah, Liz is all about the monkeys. Oh, yeah, Kratz Creatures. I watched that whenever I stayed homesick from school, says Shadowwind. Yeah, yeah, it was on where I lived. I think Kratz Creatures was on like as soon as I got home from school. So I would come home and watch that and usually Wishbone also back to back. And I was probably significantly older than their um, their target audience at that time. <laughs> but I really, really, really love those shows. And Yuki says, I watched Zabumafu every day till they took it off TV. Yeah. I think that actually, I think they had another show after that. I think it was called The Wild Kratz. I never watched that one. I did catch a little bit of Zabumafu here and there, but I never got to see Wild Kratz. Um, yeah, I learned, I think I learned about echidnas from them. I never had heard of echidnas before. 
For some reason, that one really sticks out in my memory. <sighs> All right, so terrible Professor Lombardi. Nobody likes that guy. My guess is that he got home early from the salon because he got way too drunk at the party and they kicked him out. So then he came back with Tina and he got yelled at again, which means he's making poor life choices and probably needs to get some help with his alcohol problem. Ah, all right, let's see. How much do we have left to go? I'm gonna do, do, do. We've got two more chapters. Oh, wait, no, I'm looking at the wrong one. Yeah, we have two more chapters. Both of them are shorter than the one that I just read. So we've got a little bit of time. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions to offer before I go back into the reading? Mm -hmm. Phone just buzzed. Okay, nothing too important, looks like. Okay. So we're coming up on the end of the story. We've only got two chapters left. Oh gosh, I think that the next chapter is the one that I made most of the changes to, so <laughs> fingers crossed. All right. Okay, here goes, folks. Chapter 11. After the scene with the professor, neither of us wanted to drink any more wine. We switched to whiskey. But the incident with Professor Lombardi had switched something in Liz's brain. We sat on the couch in silence, me scrolling my phone while Liz absently stroked the fur of a succession of monkeys who took turns lying in her lap. Her eyes were distant. I don't think she even noticed how astonishingly polite our primate pals were being as they waited their turns for her affection. Francis the TT, meanwhile, sprawled across my lap on his back, snoozing with his tummy exposed and snoring in a criminally adorable way every so often. After a while, Liz turned to me abruptly. No, we can't be sending these guys into unknown situations with strangers anymore, she said, as if we were concluding a conversation we'd been having all evening. I blinked. Liz, that is our entire business model. It doesn't matter, she fired back. Tina was in danger tonight, Leo. Real danger. If that absolute shit show had happened somewhere else, not in our mudroom, she could have been lost, frightened, injured, even killed. She took a deep breath, her eyes spitting green sparks at me. Yes, I agree with you that a better vetting system is in order, but we need to do more than that. We need to go along to Party Primates gig so we can keep watch over Tina and anyone else we send out. She looked fondly over at the macaque, who was snoozing comfortably with Polly on a pillow in the corner. Well, near a pillow. They would both sort of slid off into a pile on the floor. They were both macaques, though a very different and widely dispersed species. Polly had about five pounds on Tina, while Tina had a much lo longer and more luxurious tail. Still, they'd hit it off well. I let part of my brain ponder whether they spoke a similar simian body language, while the other part of my brain began thinking about the numbers. They did not look good. But Liz, I began. Don't start with me, Leo, she barked, cutting me off. I noted that her teeth were bared and shut the hell up. She gestured to the night monkey in her lap. Do you really want Lydia here? That's Adrian, I interrupted. Liz rolled her eyes. Okay, do you want Adrian here thrown into a dangerous situation like Tina just was? Adrian looked between us with her huge eyes and chittered uncertainly. I sighed. Well, no, of course not. It's not just the safety of the monkeys I'm concerned about, Liz continued as if I hadn't spoken, one hand swirling the whiskey in her don't talk to me until I've had my coffee mug. That professor was absolutely shit-faced, and he still noticed we're not properly set up for this. And he isn't even the first one to get suspicious about us. Remember that, uh, Daisy woman? She hasn't stopped nosing around since the second she got here. She's on to us. I think she's just obsessed with Sandy, I said. Wants to take her home for good. Well, it doesn't matter what her motivation is, Liz fired back. Sure, we have her contact information, but we don't know where she lives. If she decided not to return Sandy, what would we do? Call animal control? She snorted into her mug before taking a sip. Not fucking likely, she finished. I pursed my lips. I truly had not thought of that. We can collect addresses, Liz, I intoned. But that's not the only issue, Leo, she replied, matching my tone. I squinted, unsure if she was mocking me or not. Daisy, or anyone else who rents from us right now, could easily pick up the phone and report us for having a non-professional setup if, she, if they get mad... 
Oh, wait. Uh, uh, I found a problem. Hang on. It's going to highlight it. Okay. Daisy could easily pick up the phone and report us for having a non-professional setup if she gets mad that she can't get to Sandy. And bam! All these monkeys are out of here, along with whatever they fine us for keeping a freaking army of wild animals in our apartment. She sighed and shook her head again as Adrian roused himself off of Liz's lap. Or herself, rather. Adrian is a her. Adrian roused herself off Liz's lap and meandered toward the kitchen, lazily digging one finger into her oversized pink ear as she went. One of the common marmosets promptly took her place as Liz's already warm on Liz's already warm lap. Liz didn't seem to notice the exchange, just began stroking Bert's, or maybe it was Ernie's, markedly fluffier hide as she continued. The only way we can guarantee our, our own safety and that of our charges is to go along personally with the monkey's gigs. One gig per night, max. One of us has to stay here with the troop. I ran the numbers in my head. It's not going to be very profitable, I groused. Her jaw dropped, which, frankly, I thought was a bit dramatic. Leo, you didn't honestly think that a business model involving 17 monkeys was going to be free of expenses. When I didn't respond immediately, she shook her head and began petting Bert or Ernie again. Anyway, we'll jack up our prices. As you said earlier, they're monkeys. Freaking monkeys. We could rent them out for a grand a night. Easy. And if we go along with them, we can charge for our time as well. Not to mention transportation, insurance. I cocked my head to the side, confused. But we don't have... She rolled her eyes. Of course we don't have insurance, but it sure would look good on an itemized invoice. Very official and all. The marmoset cooed softly and grabbed Liz's hand, nuzzling it. We could easily charge a grand or more per gig. As soon as we've made enough, we could hire help so that we can take more gigs per night. It's the only way. I scratched the back of my neck, trying to think fast. It wasn't that I disagreed with anything she was saying exactly. It was just that, aside from what we'd made tonight, minus the fruit and wine, I had exactly $6.12 in my bank account. I didn't think that was going to fly as an argument, however, so I stayed quiet. After a short pause, she looked down at Ernie and said, Think of what these poor little babies have been through, Leo. They were lab monkeys, right? With that, she brought her eyes back up to mine searchingly, almost accusingly. I held her gaze, but was too flustered to reply. Was she calling me out? She worked her jaw, holding my gaze. They've been subjected, <clears throat> they've been subjected to tests, pokes, prods. Hell, they probably shaved them. Can you imagine how humiliated they must have been and afraid? I, s I opened my mouth, ready to spout something about how the university lab was renowned for its humane treatment of animals. But Liz stopped me as if she knew what I was thinking. If that lab got shut down, it's probably because they were treating the poor things terribly. Right? I nodded quickly, adopting a pitying look as Francis stretched, stretched luxuriously in my lap, his tail twitching slightly. So what I'm saying, Leo, is that our new friends deserve the highest possible level of care. We can't just be tossing them out into the clutches of God knows who to do God knows what. They're traumatized enough already. And if that means there was a knock on the door, which Francis was apparently not expecting because he jolted up from my lap, screeching maniacally, and took off into the bathroom where something immediately crashed to the floor. Liz rolled her eyes and went after him while I went to answer the door. Okay, that was chapter 11. We have one more chapter to go before the end of the story! <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Um, anybody say anything? The monkey story is great. Shadowin said lol about something. I wonder what. And Yuki said Liz is the best. She wants to keep the monkey safe. <laughs> Shadowin says agreed. I love Liz. Oh, but did you notice though that little moment where Liz said that they could charge for insurance that they don't have because it looks official? She wants to keep the monkeys safe, but she is also in this game. She is kind of excited about making money. But she is. She's she's taming things a little bit. She's holding Leo back from his very worst impulses. So I guess she's still the hero. <laughs> um, Shadowwind says, I was lolling at the insurance thing. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, I feel like the insurance thing was kind of Liz, like, speaking Leo's language a little bit, you know? Um. 
Because, like, she does want to be on his side. He's just an out-of-control maniac, and she's trying to, like, reel things back in a little bit. <laughs> State Farm Mutual. Oh, yeah! I could make it a State Farm Mutual insurance policy. Ooh, wait, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a note of that. Um... So as you could probably tell, I was finding some errors throughout as I read that last section because I did quite a bit of editing on it. All right, I'm making a state farm or state. Wait, what is it? What do we call our insurance company again? State Farm Mutual. State Farm. But isn't that the actual company? Farm State. It's Farm State Mutual. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Um, Vlanders, go save the monkeys, says Yuki. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Vlanders. I wonder, no, Vlanders and Leo might be too much alike. I don't know. They could really get up to shenanigans together, I think. So anyone who's watching doesn't know, Vlanders is a Puka character from our friend Bon Bon's um, series about Mirna and the circus creatures, but it goes way beyond the circus. I think her first book is about circus creatures. And that's where she meets Vlanders, and Vlanders is a Puka, and he's quite the troublemaker, and he's very, very powerful. And um, Yuki has a plushie that she made of Vlanders, who does pretty much everything with her, I believe. And he is apparently watching this live stream. And she is trying to convince him that he should come and save the monkeys. <laughs> ah, all right. Okay. Here we go, folks. This is the last chapter. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so this is where I actually kind of had to, like, um, I was going to make more changes. And I didn't actually have time to make all of the changes that I wanted to. So I did kind of smush some things together so there may still be a few items that I'm gonna be reading and be like whoa <laughs> okay here goes chapter 12 I came back in with Danny the male spider monkey a few minutes later the salon owner said he'd been a big hit but she had had to lock him away in a back room toward the end of the night as the crowd was trying to convince her to cut his hair I was glad that she hadn't from my spot on the floor I could hear Liz and Francis arguing her in words, and him in a high-pitched jabber over the last remnants of the fruity shampoo. I let the subject drop for the rest of the evening. Liz took my silence as acquiescence about the changes to the business, and although I had caught a sad, tired look on her face a few times, she lit up quite a bit when Philo the squirrel monkey got home from his performance art event. He frankly gave me the creeps with his angry-looking eyebrows and unpredictably violent behavior, but Liz seemed to cool him down a bit and they were fairly attached at the hip by the time we finished the whiskey. A minor kerfuffle broke out between the night monkeys around 2.30 over who got to sleep closest to the baseboard radiator, and everyone else chose sides, cheering them on with hoots and howls from the sidelines. Liz and I moved in to break things up just as the neighbors upstairs started stomping on the floor in frustration. The simians scattered like cockroaches from the noise, and I wondered if it sounded like thunder to their wild ears. Together, we managed to get everyone bedded back down with more grooming, punctuated by giggles. We eventually ended up grooming each other, which led to a few stolen smooches that reminded me of times long gone, and turned her eyes a dark green that made my heart flutter. Eventually, I passed out, next to Liz, right there on the floor. I woke up at four and considered staying there, just like that, drowsing happily in a pile of monkeys with Liz by my side. Instead, I quietly got her and Philo into her bed before heading back to my room. I couldn't pick Lambert, my usual bed buddy, out of the furry lump of snoozing primates, so I took Marge the pygmy marmoset with me instead. In bed, I updated the Craigslist ad with higher prices. There would be time to negotiate tomorrow when offers started coming in to pay our rent in a single night. Oh, yep, there's a cut and paste problem. <laughs> All right. There would be time to negotiate tomorrow. We would address the future of the business then. For now, things were looking pretty close to perfect. I woke around 10 to a ruckus in the living room. Squeaks, hoots, and, un and an unnerving sound of en masse motion had me jumping to my feet in socks and boxers and scooping Marge up from the pillow in one movement. I yanked open the bedroom door and blinked in the harsh morning light pouring in through the bay window and... Oh, shit. 
the open front doors. Dashing out into the middle of the room, I looked out the window to see the tails of nearly a dozen monkeys disappearing over the fence, around the corner, and into the trees around our little carriage house courtyard. My stomach dropped out from under me as I turned slowly to take in the room. A mostly empty room, scattered with hand-me-down and dumpster diving furniture, topped with tufts of fur. And Sandy, the female spider monkey, sitting alone in the midst of it all, petting her tail again. And Clyde, the capuchin, off in the corner, holding the starfruit aloft in victory. I stared at him for a moment. He was pleased with himself, I noted, as he shook the fruit. Then, a burbling sound from the corner near the door. I turned to see the frat kid, Jason or Justin or whatever, with Lambert on his shoulder. I blinked, uncomprehending, as he took me in from my white-socked feet to Marge clinging tenaciously to my disheveled hair. What the fuck are you doing here, man? I asked, lead in my belly. His mouth was slightly open as he blinked back at me. Lambert cooed and looked back and forth between the two of us. I, uh... He reached up to scratch his head nervously. I'm sorry I didn't get back last night, he said with an embarrassed smile. The door to Liz's room cre creaked open and I swallowed as realization dawned. Lambert here was great, and my friend and I were just having so much fun. I forgot to bring him back before we uh, fell asleep, you know? Every shuffling footstep Liz took toward us echoed in the pit of my stomach. I brought him back as soon as I woke up and realized, said Jared or Jacob or whatever. I closed my eyes as I heard Liz gasp and cross the threshold between the hardwood of the hallway and the carpet of the living room. And I'm willing to pay for the whole night, of course, John or Jeremy or whatever continued, as I took a deep breath that was supposed to be calming, but just made me shake more. He bit his lip and looked around the empty room just as Marge chirped and leaped from my shoulder back toward where Liz was approaching quietly. Capuchin in the corner squealed his victory call again, pounding the starfruit onto the carpet, and Sandy trilled low in her throat, still petting the tip of her tail. I, uh, he swallowed. I did knock when I got here, but when nobody answered, I noticed the door was unlocked, and I thought I would just, sure, man, I said quietly to Josh or James, sure. A brief silence. I, uh, I hope you've got insurance on all those monkeys he said too brightly. Suddenly, Liz was beside me, vibrating with rage, but I couldn't bring myself to look at her. Philo was hissing at Joe or Jesse or whatever from her shoulder. Lambert bared his teeth in response and scurried to the floor where he bounded through my open bedroom door. I'll just, um, let myself out, Jeff or Jimmy said quietly, backing toward the door. I'll send you that payment from the car. Then he was gone and the light was still pouring in through the window, and the two, two doors he had left open. I felt the tiniest prickle of hope that Lucy the Vervet and Ricky the Guinon would come back in from where they'd scrambled over the fence a few minutes ago. Liz and I stood in silence, side by side, as Sandy walked awkwardly to the door on her back legs, still petting her own tail, and sat down on the outer threshold, ululating softly. No doubt she was hoping her mate Danny would return closed my eyes again. Party primates was over. Monkey maids was never going to happen. The capuchin approached me and carefully set down the star fruit, looked around for a moment, then wrapped his arms around my ankle. Philo the spider monkey lost no time and leaped to the floor, grabbed the star fruit, and scrambled past Sandy out the door and into the daylight with it tucked under his arm. With a terrible squeal, Clyde let go of me and tore across the room to follow, using Sandy the spider monkey as a jumping off point. Sandy looked back at us inquiring, inquiringly, then stepped out into the late morning sunshine. I heard a sigh from beside me and turned to Liz, whose arms were crossed as if to protect herself from the scene, her eyes shining with tears that she blinked, black, blinked back furiously in the bright morning light. Marge the pygmy marmoset trembled on her shoulder. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I was glad Marge hadn't gone. She was too small to make it out there on her own. Lambert emerged from my bedroom and sat in the doorway watching us. Liz sighed again from somewhere deep inside herself, and then handed Marge to me without looking me in the eye. Here, she said simply. I accepted the tiny monkey without a word, watching Liz's shoulders slump as she turned away, walked back to her bedroom off the kitchen, and closed the door behind her.
that's it. Ta-da! <laughs> that's the end. Um, Yuki says, Vlanders would keep the monkeys safe because Vlanders is good. That's true, Yuki. That's true. Vlanders is fundamentally good. So he and Leo might get up to some shenanigans, but he would probably stop Leo from doing anything too ridiculous that might hurt the monkeys. Santa even said Vlanders was good on Santa's Easter stream today. Whoa, Santa did an Easter stream? That's cool. I didn't know he got in on other holidays. Very exciting. Um, Yuki says, Liz, no, you need to keep monkeys safe, not kissing. <laughs> yeah, I think Liz probably shouldn't have had whiskey. I think that was a bad idea. Um, she got a little distracted. Yuki says, go look for the monkeys. Go find the poor monkeys. JL says, I'm sad now. Yuki wants to know what happens to the monkeys. JL says, I hope that those 17 monkeys show up in another story someday, maybe along with Dwayne. <laughs> Dwayne shows up somewhere topped by 17 monkeys. Well, well, so let's see. At the end of the story, there's still two monkeys in the apartment. So 15 monkeys are outside. Um, and I think probably what's going to happen is Leo is probably going to go close the door to keep the last two monkeys inside. They're probably going to go look for them. But um, you know, finding a bunch of monkeys, probably not too easy. Also, like some of them might try to come back. I feel like definitely at least a few of them would try to come back, but they don't really know where they are, you know? Um, so some of them might be able to find their way back on their own, but some might not. Hopefully what I would hope would happen in a city situation like this is that people would see the monkeys and call animal control and then they would get picked up and then they would get, you know, adopted by zoos or other places where they'll be treated well. Probably much better than Liz and Leo could take care of them. <laughs> that's my hope, but that's where the story ends. So we can kind of decide what we think is going to happen. My question is, if they end up with just these two monkeys, they've got um, Marge, the pygmy marmoset, and I think uh, Lambert, the golden lion tamarind are still in there. If they have those two monkeys, what do you think they should do? Should they keep them as pets? Should they continue party primates with just two monkeys? What do you think? I'm open to opinions. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba, maybe a long time. Santa did an Easter stream. That's really cool. That sounds so cute. You did? Does he wear his whole Christmas outfit, or does he wear like an outfit that's in Easter colors? Um, Jail says Sky is crying on the floor. <laughs> Don't cry, Sky. It's just a story. The monkeys are fine. Uh, <laughs> I can hear out there yelling. <laughs> Shadowin says, I think a kind monkey rehab rescue captures the loose ones and takes care of them. That's what I think, too. There's definitely like a zoo or rehab center that would take them in as long as they get, you know, found and reported by the right people. So hopefully there are responsible citizens out there that will call them in. Um, does a circus or a zoo find the monkeys, says Yuki. I hope so. I think so. Um, they should get a proper license and keep them, says Shadowwind. They have no money. They have no resources. I don't, I wonder, I wonder what it's like to get a license for keeping, you know, exotic animals in like a commercial way. Or I guess it would probably be different if it's just personal. I don't know. I didn't look into any of this. <laughs> so feel free to, um, to inform me of anything that you might know about that I don't. Um, Yuki says, give the monkeys to a better home where they will be safe, but no more renting them out, says Shadowwind. Okay, I, I think that's definitely the better idea. And I feel like that's probably what Liz will say too. Um, Leo will probably fight that because he needs money. <laughs> and he thought he was going to make money on this. But like, Leo, you could do a live stream with your monkey or something if you want to make money on your monkey but not put it in danger or heck you could rent yourself out and bring your monkey with you for certain events you know as long as you are taking good care of the monkey and not just sending them out with rando strangers like a duty head mm -hmm. santa is friends with the easter bunnies bunny helper was with santa and they read easter Easter Bunny books. Oh, okay. Oh, that's so cute. 
There you go. Monkey live stream, right? If I had a monkey, I would definitely make sure that that monkey was on the live stream sometimes. I mean, that's that's a real draw. But I guess that would only be if you had, you know, a license to have said monkey. Otherwise, you'd be getting yourself into trouble. If you, like, hold up the license at the beginning of the stream, be like, everyone, this is fine. It's fine that I have a monkey. Well, it's only fine, I mean, if you're good to the monkey also. The license is only part of it. <laughs> so, as you may have noticed, I tend to have a thing with... um endings that aren't super definitive, you know? Uh, so this is one of them. But I will have you know that the original ending that I had for this story was much more violent. <laughs> and I decided that it was unnecessary. I did not need monkey on monkey violence for this to be a good story. I am interested, however, to see what anyone here thinks about sort of the pacing. Like, I know the story starts out really strong because we have just Leo in the apartment and things are just crazy and there's, you know, action all over the place and monkey shenanigans. And then when Liz shows up, things kind of slow down. She like calms the energy a bit. Um, but my question for you is, do you think that the energy gets too calm before the end? Like, is it kind of boring, like reading, you know, the back and forth conversations between them? Or do you think that it's still flows well. And I really, I want honest answers here. Like if you got bored, please tell me because I need to fix that. And I have 17 monkeys to keep things from getting boring. So it's easy enough for me to figure out something to keep things moving along. <coughs> the only thing is I, you know, I don't want it to get too terribly long. So I have to keep things a little short, but we can definitely manufacture some excitement if I need to. Um, Shadowwind says, I like open endings. Oh, I'm so glad that you do. I do too. I really like things leaving off where I can use my imagination a little bit about what happens next. Um, it's like inviting the audience to be creative and think what would happen. Exactly. Exactly. Shadowwind says, I think it flows well and I was not bored at all. Yay! Oh, hooray! <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I like open endings, too. I like being able to feel like my imagination is part of the story. But, you know, I think that it's just kind of like some people really want things to be wrapped up neatly. And some people like open endings. And, it you know, it's fine to be either way. But I am definitely a writer and a reader who appreciates a little bit more open-endedness. Um, Yuki says, I really liked it after Liz was helping. Oh, good. <laughs> right, that makes sense. Because before Liz shows up, you're kind of like, Oh my God, what is happening? This is going to end in disaster. And it still does. And only it's only partly Liz's fault. They left the door open. Like they should have, you have 17 monkeys in an apartment. They all have opposable thumbs. You need to be locking your doors. You probably need multiple locks on the doors because sooner or later, some of those monkeys, you're going to figure out the doorknobs and like a deadbolt. No problem. I mean, really, you should probably be putting them in kennels or something overnight. Like, I don't like the idea of kenneling animals, especially not monkeys. But, like, you could give them, you know, really nice, comfy beds for them to sleep in. But just having a bunch of monkeys in the apartment, you, you can't be leaving your doors open. Terrible, a terrible idea. So, also, if you have 17 monkeys in your apartment, you shouldn't be drinking whiskey until you fall asleep. <laughs> like Leo's very irresponsible, but Liz is also culpable here. She should have been paying more attention. They're both also culpable for the fact that neither of them realized that Lambert did, Lambert did not come home. Not cool. Not cool at all. <laughs> they drank enough whiskey, they left the door open, and they did not even do a head count. Like, come on, folks. And even, like, like... Uh, Leo was like, oh yeah, I can't find Lambert right now. Whatever, I guess I'll just uh, sleep with Marge instead of with Leo with Lambert. Like, dude, where's Lambert? He's the easiest one to find. He has bright orange fur. Like, this is a problem. So the fact that they all ran away at the end makes some sense. Just saying. Um, Yuki says, I'm just going to think the monkeys join a circus with lots of clowns. <laughs> all the locks for the doors. And Santa needs to put those two on the bad list. <laughs> for sure. Those two are definitely getting coal for Christmas. 
<sighs> well, that's it. I, I am going to be doing a little bit more editing and massaging of the last part of the story. And also, um, the what I read of part two, I actually made some changes to as well. Um, I moved some things from part three into part two. So all the stuff that I have read so far is still in the process of changing and is going to be continuing to change between now and when the story is published. However, we are going to be kickstarting the publication of this book in May. Right now we're aiming for May 2nd as our launch date and we're working on the Kickstarter page. So we should have the, the pre-launch page for that up ASAP. I'm going to be working on it for the rest of the week. And I hope that when that goes up, y'all will follow the project and help us make it successful. Um, the last time that we did the Existentia um, campaign for Dwayne, that's what it's called, um, last year, it did really well and it was a really fun campaign. So I'm hoping that this one will also be good. And then after that, we'll have more Tales from Existentia. I actually, the other day, just woke up with a new tale from Existentia in my head. And I am planning to co-write that with my girlfriend, Lenny. Um, we shared a whole bunch of ideas and we're both really excited about it. So that one may end up being sort of a full length novel. I think it's going to be significantly longer than this one in Dwayne. So it'll probably take a while to finish, but I'm really, really excited about it. <sighs> um, Yuki says, I do really like the monkey story a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Yuki. I am sad that we didn't actually get to see any monkey maids. They would be real cute with little like maid aprons, you know, <laughs> like little feather dusters. <laughs> uh, but they'd probably be terrible maids. I just can't imagine that expecting a monkey to go into people's houses and actually clean would, would get very far. It's a really, truly a terrible idea. <laughs> Um, Yuki says, will it have clowns in it? Hmm. It could. It could. This new Existentia story that I just dreamed up could very well have clowns in it. And I actually found a place in this story where I, I don't think that we'll have a whole lot of room for, like, building up a clown character. But I do have a place where I could probably drop one in. So that might happen. <sighs> oh, this is our shortest reading by far. I actually thought that it was going to be way long for some reason. I don't know why. I guess it just felt longer because I was working on the story all day today. So it felt like I had written so much, but it wasn't actually that much. Um, I could draw monkey maids for your Kickstarter. Oh my God, Yuki. That would be amazing. I would love to see that. Holy moly, some <laughs> monkey maids. <laughs> oh my gosh. That would be great. Maybe, oh, wonder. Hmm. I was going to say a coloring page of Monkey Maids would be great. But then I thought, no, I want to see how Yuki would color the Monkey Maids. So I think I would rather have a full painting for that. Maybe we could make art prints for it or something that we could like, ooh, we could do like a stretch goal where when we hit a certain amount, we add the art print of your Monkey Maids to people's um, rewards or something. We'll talk about it more later. Nobody needs to know all of our secrets before the Kickstarter launches, but I love that idea. Thank Yuki, thank you so much for being such a fan of Monkey Maids and everyone else who has been here for the readings and who is watching this in the future and the replay. Thank you so much for being here. Um, like I said before, I am open to feedback. So anyone who's watching this in the future, in the replay, feel free to you know drop some comments. I'll see them. And if you have some great ideas, I'd love to hear them. So I guess, I guess I'll wrap it up and that'll, that'll be it for Monkey Maids for now, but keep your eyes on kickstarter.oneshipress.com because the, we're going to be funding this story as a book, an ebook and an audio book in the month of May in 2023. And your support would mean the absolute world and would also mean that I get to make this book a thing. So let's do it. Yeah. Um, Yuki says, um, I could do both a painting and coloring page. I love monkeys. <laughs> more monkeys means more good, right? <sighs> Thank you, Yuki. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone else. I am gonna 
go do some of the editing of the little bits that I noticed needed editing while I was reading. So thank you all for being here and I'll see you in May when we launch this Kickstarter. So see you then. Thank you. Bye.